Hello everybody and welcome to my presentation on system level tests in virtual environments. My name is Markus Eggenberger and I'm a senior developer at Vector. Today I'm going to talk about the importance of system level tests, their difference to the well-established unit and integration tests and how virtual environments can help you speed up your time to market. But before we go into the details, let me frame the scene here. The focus of my presentation is the development of so-called cyber-physical systems. In cyber-physical systems, an embedded device, for example an EE or IoT device, is connected to its natural physical environment. It gets data about this environment through a set of sensors and it controls the environment via some actuators. Furthermore, the embedded device is often connected to other devices or even backend services, which we combinedly refer to as the software system environment. Here you can see an overview of the different test phases that you typically go through the development cycle. I will cover those test phases bottom up in the next slides, but you can already see that there is a clear delineation between the system level tests on top and the rest. Unit and integration tests have the benefit that they can be executed in software tests and software environments, while the system level tests have to be executed on the target hardware. Okay, let's have a look at the characteristics of the different test phases. Unit tests are your bread and butter. They are typically developed by the same person who wrote the original function to be tested and therefore they classify as white box tests. That means that the tester exactly knows what is going inside the function and to test it he se selects a set of input values, applies them to the function and verifies that the output meets its expectations. Unit tests are typically executed by a test harness which calls the function and the test harness is also responsible for providing stop, stops of functions that are currently not available. You will probably end up with a lot of unit tests because you have to test many, many combinations of input, uh, input values and output examples. Therefore, Unit tests also serve the purpose of documenting your code and they make sure that if changes to your code are necessary, the function of the, uh, of the original developed function is still the same. So you've written your function and you've probably tested it and you will probably write even more functions and in the end they will comprise a module. Your colleagues will probably do pretty much the same writing their own modules and those modules will eventually be integrated into a software component where they have to work alongside each other. And since both of you have properly tested your individual functions, you can be pretty sure that this works out of the box, right? Yeah, well, only if you're lucky, because unit tests only ensure that the functions work as you expected them to work. However, here you can see a great example where two drawers have been properly unit tested, but they obviously fail to integrate with each other. This brings us to the integration tests. Integration tests are again white box tests because you know how your modules are integrated with each other in the software component. This means that an integration test is set up by determining a set of input values, you apply them to the modules in the order that they will exactly be called when they are integrated into the software component and again you check the output of the computation. Also the execution of integration tests is very similar to that of unit tests because the test harness ensures the call sequence is executed and it is also responsible for stubbing functions that are currently not available. Unfortunately, this is not the end of testing yet. So you have developed your software component and it has been properly tested. Uh, but then it will be integrated with other software components into subsystems, which are then further incorporated into your system under test. And not only do you have to make sure that all these subsystems play nicely with each other, but you also have to make sure that your system under test works well with the environment. Most importantly, you have to make sure that your system under test can handle pretty much any data the sensor throws at you. 
sensor data can, for example, be spurious, it can be lossy, it can be even delivered at a higher frequency that you would expect, it can be erroneous. You might have multiple sensors and their individual values might not line up, or the value of some sensor might be outright wrong because it is delivered outside of the value range that is valid. Likewise, you have also to ensure that your system under test operates the actuators correctly. Otherwise, you have to expect damages of the environment, which means that expensive equipment can be broken or even worse, people can be hurt. Last but not least, you have to make sure that your system under test also communicates well with the software system environment, which means you have to make sure that backend communication works or if other embedded devices are involved, that their communication works. This is where the system level tests obviously come in. But system level tests are fundamentally different to the integration and unit tests as they are black box tests. This means that your, so, uh, that your system under test runs completely autonomously on the target hardware and is not executed by a test harness. This also means that to stimulate your system under test, you have to do these stimulations at the physical interface of your system which might mean turning a knob to a certain value or applying a dedicated voltage to one of the input pins. Likewise, observing the correct behavior of your system under test means that you have to check the voltage of an output pin or you have to see if the actuator did set a dial correctly, for example. Such system level tests typically require expensive test rigs and they often require manual or manual execution or even or at least manual interaction. All of this makes the system level tests quite time consuming and also expensive. Let me now show you how virtualization can help with this regards. There are many ways how you can apply virtualization to system level tests and I will go over them in the next slides. First of all, you can put your system on the test in a virtual execution environment. And once you've done this, you've refrained yourself of all the limitations that come with the existence of uh, with actual hardware. For example, you now can run as many tests in parallel as you want, and you no longer have to worry that your developers and tester fight, co fight or compete over available test hardware. You even can run now your tests much earlier in your development cycle, which allows you to see if you're, which allows you to discover major design faults at, at your system interfaces. This is possible because you no longer have to wait for the ability, uh, the availability of the actual target hardware, which is most important if you're following a hardware software co-design pro process where the final hardware might not exist yet. One of the more obvious aspects is that you have freed yourself of platform or architecture constraints. That means your test hardware and the, uh, ta the target environment can totally differ. You can run the target in a virtual environment so it does not have to match up with your host that runs the test. You are also possible to run critical scenarios. For example, you can see how a completely outlier for a sensor value that would be a too high voltage um, would be handled by a system under test without risking to fry your expensive prototype. But we can do even more than just virtualize the execution environment of our system or under test. We can also virtualize the physical environment. If we virtualize our physical environment, we can simplify the test specification and test execution because we no longer have to dial in certain values at knobs or apply certain voltages. We can specify in a script the dedicated values for the inputs that we want to test our system in. This also means that we can have more deterministic and way more reproducible tests because with each iteration that you run the tests, you can be sure that the very same values are applied to your tests and the very same test is executed. And now, since your environment is totally virtualized, you can even put your tests into an automated test routine, which means you can execute the tests alongside in your continuous integration and continuous testing environment, which means 
you can test all the way, all the time during your development cycle, ensuring that you have uh, high confidence in the final product. Again, you can also test critical scenarios, which means you can operate your system under test at extreme limits, which would otherwise perhaps impact um, the environment or damage the environment. And you can see and ensure that this does not happen. Similar to the virtualization of the physical environment, we can also virtualize our software system environment. By virtualizing our backend communication, we can use models instead of cloud services, for example, where we can dedicatedly model the behavior that we want to test. We can apply certain communication patterns to our system and the test and see if it operates correctly. Same holds for, the, uh, for other devices. We can also test more critical failures that would not so would not so be so good in a live environment. So we could actually test the failure and outage of a backend service. We also can now run parallel tests without interference because each test execution will get its dedicated instances of the models and they will not compete over the res resources in the actual cloud environment. One of the not so obvious benefits of the virtual environments is that you can test individual software components in a system level environment. Let me show you how this works. Instead of immediately testing your whole system under test, you start by only testing a dedicated single software component in isolation. All the other software components that are needed in your system under test are replaced by models. And with that, you can test one component in isolation. Once this works, you move your way up by integrating other software components, which are then integrated into subsystem, so you can test the subsystem and ensure that this subsystem works. Eventually, you can then test the whole system, and once you do this, you can be sure that you, are, or you have a way higher confidence that this will work because you've tested all your subcomponents individually. This also helps by di uh, for diagnostics when you want to make sure uh, that you want to locate a certain fault in a certain software component if a system level test fails. If we look again at our test phases, we see that we still have our unit and integration tests just as before and also our system level tests are still there. But with the help of virtual environments, we have now the ability to execute system level tests on a pure software basis. And this allows us to run system level tests much more frequently and much earlier in your design process. And with that, you reduce the number of tests that you have to execute on the actual target hardware. To bring all this to life, we have developed a powerful tool at Vector, which is Canufa Software. Let me show you how this works. First of all, you start by putting your system under test into a virtual execution environment. This could be a virtual machine, a Docker container, or an emulator, pretty much anything that fits best your design flow. You use then Canufa software to model your physical environment as well as the software system environment. And finally, you connect the system under test at its functional system interface to those virtual models that are available in Canoe. The functional system interface is not, is compared to the physical interface, not the dials, but the functions inside the model or inside your system under test that access the values of those models. Unfortunately, showing you how this works in detail is out of the scope of this in presentation. But I invite you to stop by at our booth and join one of our live tool demos where you can see Canoe for software in action. For now, I just want to give you a brief set of teasers of the benefits that Canufa Software has for you. First of all, Canufa Software offers a wide range of abilities to model your environment in a natural way. For example, you can use MATLAB models to, um, to model your different components of your environment, or you can model the behavior using scripts such as C Sharp. One of the key features of Canufa Software and which is crucial in, uh, in developing and executing system level tests is to monitor your values and your system over time. So here you can see that we can plot 
values of the uh, values of the input and output values at your system under test over the time using curves. You can track the state of the different values in your system, and you can even keep track of all the individual samples that are both applied to the SUD or are later retrieved and observed. And you have the ability to go even one step further with the integration of VTest Studio, which is a great tool to design and implement automated tests that can then be executed by Canoe for software. These tests, when they are executed, can then provide detailed analysis and trace results, giving you a high confidence over the quality of your system. Let me wrap this up. I've just shown you that even thorough unit and integration tests are insufficient to ensure the quality of your product, making system level tests a crucial step in your development process. And even though traditionally system level tests are time consuming and expensive, Canoe for Software allows you to virtualize the aspects of those tests, which means you can test early and frequently. I'm now looking forward to your questions in the Q&A session. Thank you.